This is the Best of Business Talk 2018. Once again, we want to thank our stations, our affiliates for listening each week. WGCH, our home flagship station, along with Yale Radio, WYBC. And as we say, 60 minutes of radio from leading figures of the world of business, along with the business of politics and sports. So we're going to give you a business, politics, and sports highlight segment today. Chris Whipple, journalist from Old Greenwich originally, on the gatekeepers, how the chiefs of staffs in the White House define every presidency. And of course, there's a lot of chaos around the Trump presidency, so this is right up to date. Let me ask you right off the bat, I, I read something that, that Trump was uh, alleged to have you know, done one of his phone calls behind everybody's back, that, that John Kelly, the current uh, chief of staff, is overbearing, and he doesn't, he's not able to function with the instinct and impulse that Trump is. It's sort of a let Trump be Trump. What do you think of that? Well, I think that, um, you know, Kelly famously said that he wasn't put on this earth to manage the president, that he was just going to be the guy who made the West Wing trains run on time and mm. uh, and manage the information flow. And, of course, even by that narrow definition, um, I think he's he's come up short. But there's no question about it that there are times when nothing – annoys Donald Trump more than when, as he put it, uh, here's another nut job who thinks he's running things, remember? remember? Um, when when Kelly or anybody else pretends to be the quote-unquote grown-up in the room, it drives Trump crazy. Do you think, Chris, that he's trying to, and I, you, you say this in the chapter, too, you talk about trying to recreate the 26th floor of Trump Tower and the way he ran his, his really small boutique in terms of number of people business? And he's done it. I mean, that's exactly <laughs> what he's done. He's recreated the 26th floor management model from Trump Tower, and it's a complete fiasco when it comes to governing. You know, there's, you just can't run the government the way you run a family Manhattan real estate firm. It doesn't work. And other presidents have tried, in fairness to Trump, other presidents have tried similar things. Jerry Ford, when yeah. he became the accidental, so-called accidental president after Nixon's resignation, he had an idea that he would have just all of his top aides coming and going, nobody empowered as first among equals, no chain of command. He called it the quote-unquote spokes of the wheel mm -hmm. with the president at the center. Well, within a month, he realized it was a disaster. You know, he, he compared it to governing by fire hose. Uh, you needed, he needed, every president needs uh, a White House chief or someone who can be first among equals, execute the president's agenda, do all the things that a White House chief has to do. Do you th do we have a dilemma here that um, you, you, you've proven very well by your paradigm that you can't be a successful president without a chief of staff who's empowered, but Trump can't seem to be you know Trump with a chief of staff who's empowered. That may that may well be the case. You know uh, it may be mission impossible. Uh, back in two thousand December two thousand sixteen, all, all the former chiefs were invited to come to the White House and give give some advice to Reince Priebus, the incoming chief. Ten of them showed up, sat around a table, uh, and they all agreed on that, that Pre Priebus needed to be empowered. He needed to have the authority to do the job. And, of course, we all know now that he never had that. You had at least three White House chiefs during the first six months between Steve Bannon and Jared Kushner and Priebus. And Priebus, uh, you know, I interviewed him at length a number of times uh, for the new chapter in the paperback, which is out right now, as you mentioned. Uh, and Priebus insists that he knew going in that he, what all the chiefs were trying to tell him, uh, and that he just thought it would never happen with Donald Trump, that this is a guy who who was, uh, used, he is who he is, and he was going to run the place his way, and there was nothing he could do about it. Um, but the the White House chiefs themselves came away, virtually all of them, uh, shaking their heads, uh, saying to themselves, God speed, God help him, good luck. <laughs> Fascinating uh, insight, too, is uh, the chapter is called Go to War with the President of the United States, and Really, what comes out of this is the very first days in the job. A, it sets the tone of the administration with a lot of lies, and it shows it sets himself up to fail. 
It was a wild start. Yeah. Uh, the, the very first day, well, actually January 21, a little after 6 a.m., Priebus is in his, uh, at home uh, watching the cable news networks. His phone goes off, and it's guess who? Uh, Donald Trump is furious, livid, screaming at him. He's just seen the pictures in the Washington Post of his own inaugural crowd dwarfed by a photo of uh, Obama's inaugural crowd. Uh, yelling at Priebus to get this fixed immediately. And uh, Priebus says to himself, do I really want to go to war with the President of the United States on day one? Uh, well, shortly thereafter, Sean Spicer stepped up to the lectern in the uh, White House press briefing room and told those flagrant lies about the inaugural photos. And um Truth was the first casualty of the Trump presidency on day one. Uh, and as we all know, that's that's continued uh, on an almost daily basis ever since. And that's not just on Donald Trump. That's, in my mind, that's on Reince Priebus as well. And also, Reince basically set himself up to say that I'm, I can be rolled, that I'm not going to yeah. stand up to this, to this yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, look, on the one hand, uh, people might argue that um, Priebus couldn't possibly speak truth to power in the in these circumstances, uh, mm -hmm. but that's the job requirement. You know, if you talk to Jim Baker or Leon Panetta, they will tell you that's the most important thing a White House chief of staff can do, and you have to be ready to resign. You have to be ready to, to, to draw a red line and say, if you cross this, I'm, I'm gone. Jim Baker was able to, you know, once the, one story I tell in the book is the time that, that Reagan decided that he wanted to strap every cabinet officer up to a polygraph. He wanted to track down a leak, wanted to find out who was responsible. Jim Baker was on his way to lunch, and uh, when he got wind of this, he turned his car around, went back to the White House, burst into the Oval Office, confronted Reagan, and explained to him why you can't strap up to a polygraph every <laughs> cabinet member, and including the vice president of the United States, who's a constitutional officer elected. You, you, and Reagan, of course, said, oh, well, you're absolutely right, Jim, and <clears throat> ripped up the order, and that was that. You I'm have to be able to do stuff like that when you're White House chief. That reminds me, people will have to read the book. There's a great story about Jeff Sessions trying to quit and then perhaps like literally running out of the White House to, to try and prevent it from happening. Yeah, it's a story that Priebus had never told and uh, couldn't be more relevant at the moment when you consider that the you know the walls may be closing in on the Russia investigation and, and Donald Trump may try to fire uh, Sessions again. But on the evening of May 17, eight days after Comey was fired, uh, Don McGahn, the White House counsel, bursts into Priebus's office and says, not only do we have a special counsel, but the attorney general has just resigned. Priebus goes, "What?" <laughs> Races down to the west, to the uh, uh, to the parking lot, finds Attorney General Sessions sitting in a in a car with the motor running, <laughs> opens the door, drags Sessions out of the car, back up to his office, where Steve Bannon and the vice president come in and work him over with Priebus and persuade him to unresign. Uh, so. Priebus said to me, you know, Chris, that was just another day at the office. <laughs> uh, let's move to John Kelly. I mean, he looks like, first of all, he's a general out of central casting, which, you know, Trump likes, and he's supposedly an SOB. But he had a defining flaw in your mind in that he, he defined the scope of the job too narrowly? Kelly uh, tried to uh, redefine the job. In effect, he said, look, I, I was not put on this earth to manage the president just to make the trains run and, and, and manage the paper flow to the president. Well, that, that just betrays a misunderstanding of the, of the job. As I, as I said just a minute ago, I mean, both uh, Leon Panetta and James Baker would tell you that the most important part of the job is telling the president hard truths. Um, <clears throat> Josh Bolton, uh, who was George W.'s pretty effective chief at the end of uh, that that administration said to me, you know, you don't substitute your judgment for the president's. But when you think that the president is doing something that is harmful to his agenda, it's your job to point it out to the president. Um, Dick 
Cheney, uh, who was Jerry Ford's uh, very effective 34-year-old White House chief of staff, and it's a story I tell in the book. He he loves to talk about that period of his life. Cheney does. But anyway, when um, Cheney pointed out to me that, look, when you've got a really tough message that you have to tell the president, it's really bad news, you can't have eight or nine guys sitting around going, well, it's your turn to tell them. No, it's your turn to tell them. Nope. It's your turn to tell him. One person has to go in and tell him what he doesn't want to hear. We look at our best of politics in segment two. Journalist Chris Whipple, an old Greenwich resident originally, author of Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency. We'll look at the best one that he claims is James Baker. We'll look at the worst, Don Regan under Reagan, although he's now nominated John Kelly, the recently departed Trump Chief of Staff. This is Jim Campbell, host of Forensic Talk. Tune into this station on Monday evenings at 6 p.m. for deep dives into the biggest crime stories today. Unsolved murders, financial crimes, penetrating questions. I'm John Iannuzzi, producer of Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Each week, you'll hear in-depth interviews. Whether it's Bobby Kennedy Jr. on his claims his cousin Michael Skakel is innocent of the Moxley murder, or a brutally honest conversation with Kathleen Willey, one of the women alleging sexual assault in the Clinton Oval Office. Or the first interview after prison with an insider trader from the Raj Rajaratnam biggest insider trading scandal in Wall Street history. That's Monday night at 6 p.m. We'll bring you the facts, the forensic, both sides of the story, from insider trading to crimes of passion. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell is brought to you by Park City Productions. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. That's Park City Productions 06604. We're talking to Chris Whipple, the gatekeepers, how the White House Chief of Staff define every presidency. The revised paperback version is now out. And, um... Uh, one more thing on John Kelly before we talk about Bannon for a second. Um, you know, since he's come in, that you know the, the tax cut got, got through, uh, the North Korean announcement, the tariff announcements. Do, do you, does he get credit for more stuff coming out as opposed to uh, you know previous basically getting nothing through? I still think this is a broken White House that can can basically do nothing right. I think that the the, the tax cut, you know, which may uh, ultimately come back to bite the Republicans and Trump because it's not clear to me that it really helps anybody uh, in, the, in, in the middle class of the swing states. Uh, but the tax cut w- essentially was achieved only by keeping Donald Trump 100 miles away from it. You know, this, this is a guy who was supposed to be the art of the deal, and, and virtually everything he touches turns to dust. And And Kelly has... I think reinforced all of Donald Trump's worst partisan instincts, and and what I mean by that is, other presidents, um, you know, Trump is not the first president to come into office full of hubris, thinking he's the smartest guy in the room, intoxicated by his political victory. Most presidents get over that. Most presidents figure out that there's a difference between campaigning, which is demonizing and dividing and disrupting. And governing, which is a completely different thing, where you have to build coalitions and you have to reach across the aisle and you have to compromise and you expand beyond your base. Well, it's a White House chief's job to help presidents do that. And and in contrast, Kelly's done the exact opposite. He's he's really reinforced Trump's worst partisan instincts, I think, in every way from the moment he walked up to the lectern in the White House press briefing room and and attacked that congresswoman uh, with yeah. a false story to calling everybody on Capitol Hill an idiot. A White House chief, a good one, floats above the fray, doesn't get partisan. Now, even the real, try to imagine two more partisan people than Dick Cheney and Rahm Emanuel. Cheney was Jerry Ford's White House chief way back in the day. Rahm Emanuel was Obama's first chief. Those guys were fierce partisans, but... When they were White House Chief of Staff, you never would have known it when you were in the room. They were honest brokers. They didn't put their thumb on the scale. They were people who helped to execute the president's agenda, whatever it happened to be. 
You know, it's uh, funny. We, we were saying that before about having to put coalitions and stuff. James Baker is the one that came to mind right away because he sort of put this soft velvet glove around Reagan, uh, the Reagan Revolution. Uh, you talked to Steve Bannon, and does he view that the revolution's been lost uh, already, particularly with it he, since he's not there? Well, nobody would, would call Steve Bannon the velvet glove. Let, that's for sure. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, he would be the iron fist yeah. uh, as opposed to the velvet glove. But Bannon is a fascinating interview, as you can probably imagine. I, I spent a lot of time with him. He uh, He's very good at telling you stuff, as Don Rumsfeld used to put it, with the bark off. You know, he, he doesn't mince words. He told me uh, about rights previous. Was it, you know, previous said to me that, you know, for every ill-conceived, half-baked thing that Donald Trump tried, such as uh, the executive order on immigration, for every decision like that that was implemented, um, there were ten worse ideas that that Priebus claims, you know, that he stopped. Well, Bannon jokingly said to me, "I Priebus stopped twenty ideas, not ten, and ten of them were my ideas." <laughs> um, so he's anyway. He has a sense of humor, but he's he's also pretty candid about. Um, about the first uh, first you know six months under under Priebus, I think he feels that I think he and Priebus actually were 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 allies. Um, I think that Jared Kushner and uh, Ivanka really got tired of Bannon uh, and wanted to get rid of him, and and I think that uh, Priebus really allied with him, and um, the, so the two of them have. I have a certain amount of respect. Okay, let me ask you uh, this way now. You've, you've got your gold standard you call Jimmy Baker, and you've got some failed ones, Don Regan, for instance. Under Where would you put Priebus and Kelly on the continuum? If you'd asked me a year ago, I, I would have said that Don Regan, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's second White House chief, uh, who was a real disaster. Uh, hmm. It's no, no coincidence that the Iran-Contra scandal happened on his watch, for example. It never would have happened on his predecessor's watch, uh, Jim Baker's. Um, I would have said that Regan had a lock on that title. <laughs> his worst chief of staff. Now I think he's got some competition in the form of uh, Priebus and Kelly. Um, so you're, you're putting both of them at that end. I think they've both got a shot at this. And, and Kelly really is the greater failure in, in an odd way because Kelly was empowered in a way that Reince Priebus never was. Yeah. Kelly Kelly was given more authority than Priebus, uh, or seized more authority, however you want to look at it. it to some extent, his failure is, is even greater it, to some extent. And he's, as I've said before, it seems to me that he's failed even by his own very narrow definition of the job, which was making trains run on time in the West Wing. And now the trains, of course, are off the track. You look up uh, a year later, and, and the staff secretary is... is got uh, no security clearance because he's uh, accused of beating his wife. You've got 30 other people without clearances, including the guy who's in charge of Middle East peace. <laughs> You've got everyone headed for the exits and uh, and a White House that is really broken. So I think that, um, you know, sadly, I, I think that uh, I like Reince Priebus, uh, but I think that he and Kelly are contenders for that title. Do you feel that there's uh, that Kelly's uh, about to go or inevitably, inevitably going to go? And with all your knowledge, and would you would you have somebody that should have a crack at this in mind? You know, I really couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. I don't want to try to pick his successor. And as as I say, it's you know there just aren't a lot of uh, great candidates who could manage this guy, Donald Trump, in my mind. It's hard to say how long Kelly will last. I, I'm not so sure that um, he'll be gone quite as soon as everybody's predicting, uh, because he's with Donald Trump. You're in the doghouse one day and out the next, and back in and then out. Um, and I think that, um, as I say, I think that it's. I'm not sure that there's anybody in the wings that Donald Trump has in mind who could step in and 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 be more effective. You know, I've just finished saying that he's one of the least effective, and yet this may well be mission impossible with with Donald Trump, who uh, is is who he is, and as you say, maybe intellectually and temperamentally unfit for office. There's nothing anybody can do about that. 
Now, of course, if you read your book and 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 buy into everything, doesn't doesn't this say that Trump presidency has very little chance of being successful? You know, let's having said that, let me just point out that it took Jimmy Carter two and a half years yeah. to figure out that he needed to appoint a, just to just to appoint one, much less empower one. Ham Jordan never had the title for the first two and a half years, and Carter thought he could run it himself. Uh, it took. Bill Clinton a year and a half to figure out that he needed to empower a White House chief in the form of Leon Panetta. So it's um, it's, it's not hopeless. Uh, it could conceivably still happen. But as I say, it only took Jerry Ford a month to figure out that uh, he couldn't run his White House uh, like the 26th floor of Trump Tower. And I don't see any evidence that uh, Donald Trump has learned that lesson. You'll see to the best of Biz Talk 2018. Best of Biz Talk annual Buffett show. Lawrence Cunningham does his pilgrimage to Omaha. We look inside the Buffett annual meeting. Joining us right now from Omaha, welcome back. Larry, how are you? It's great to be back again with you, Jim. Everything is fine here in Omaha. Oh, my God. Reading your book uh, got me, all the juices flowing again. Before I start, I want to briefly, though, uh, John and I, I and Newsy and I, as we were preparing for this show, we found out this week that Berkshire All-Star Oriental Trading President, uh, CEO Sam Taylor, who was on our show, in fact, led off our show from Omaha, passed away. He was a humble man. He was a good man, typical of the Berkshire All-Stars. We did not know about that, so we want to just uh, mention that in passing. I assume you knew Sam as well. We, yes, we did. We, we have a tribute to him in this book written by That's right. his, Phil Terry. What's your favorite part of the weekend, by the way? You know, it's, it's sort of like trying to figure out which, which <laughs> child of mine is my favorite. You know, I, <laughs> I, 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 love, I love them all in, in different ways. I mean, the, the Q&A, you know, remains the, the pinnacle and, and the original magnet and draw, and it, it just, it's pretty exceptional. And I guess right up there for me is just meeting all my friends that I've made through Berkshire over the years, and that can, that can happen during the you know, meeting or at many of the satellite events. And I, I think it's really, that's what it comes down to, is catching up with friends. Tell us, why did you put this book together, Larry, and why do 40,000 people trek to Omaha, particularly now that you can watch it live stream on Yahoo? We put the book together because we think the shareholders are one of the most important parts of Berkshire culture, and yet it really haven't been studied so much. And I think the reason they come year after year after year is because they really are special. They have something, a set of values in common that are really part of Berkshire, and they're just as important to Berkshire's longevity as uh, who will succeed Warren Buffett. You, you need to have very high-quality shareholders that get the Berkshire culture in order for Berkshire to thrive. And so we wanted to start focusing on the shareholders. That's a great point. And briefly, because I don't think most people uh, understand this, how different a Berkshire ha- uh, annual meeting is versus the typical corporate. The typical corporate ones are staged, right, and over in like five minutes. <laughs> That's right. And very few people attend. Yes. And- and there, nothing is accomplished. There, no ideas are, are achieved. There, if, if if they have a high turnout, it's because there there's some activist agitating, and there's there's some dissension. And Berkshire is completely different. It's a partnership-like atmosphere where people are trying to learn the business, understand decisions that have been made. And in that sense, even though it's this year, I think they're expecting he's expecting forty-two thousand. Uh, it's a huge turnout, and yet in some ways, it still feels like a pretty small company that. Uh, They've had this meeting for nearly 40 years or so. Back in the old days, there were only a few hundred people. Um, and it still has a feeling. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a mob scene, but there's still a sense of there are two guys, Warren and Charlie, answering questions of shareholders and talking to them as if they're partners in a business rather than they're, you know someone's a, a fancy CEO and these are mere minions in, in, in a shareholder pool. It's, it's, a, it's a very special, very big, but still very special kind of um, company feeling. Somebody in your book says it, too, that it, it's sort of like changing your oil. You go out there to declutter from the rest of the world, and it's a whole way of life. It's a different way of thinking. It's a rational, independent way. It, the whole deal is really special. That's right. That that piece is by Shane Parrish, who is a Canadian investor who writes a really thoughtful newsletter and, and blog called Farnham Street, which is the, the address, obviously, where Berkshire is headquartered. And that idea of um, a, a oil change for the soul is he, he makes this point that 
um, the people who attend are the people he'd like to be. They're smart, they're thoughtful, they're rational, and, and that's how he wants to be. And uh, the other neat point that he makes is that the answers are the same every year. When Warren and Charlie are holding forth on that stage, they're not making up new points or developing new principles. They're, they're time-tested, old-fashioned principles about patience, long-term, integrity, candor, quality businesses, good returns on invested capital. It's the same answers every year, but that's, that's sort of the point. Um, there's a stability, a, a reliability uh, that's very assuring to people. And, um, and it also just makes sense. And so that oil change is like, well, you just need to, to stay clean. You know, you need to be rejuvenated, refreshed. I mean, um, and, and it's a, that's a big important part of the whole catharsis, I think, of the weekend. The book is really, really, through the contributors and everything, gives you the ecosystem that's been built around this meeting. And what, what almost is the main purpose for all you guys now is to get together and network. How did you, how did you pick some of the guys that, uh, that were in it? And tell the Joel Greenblatt story, how you, you actually uh, gave away, they gave away 5,000 copies of your essays book. Oh, yeah, that's a great story. And we, we picked these people. Uh, we, we know them, obviously. and We wanted to have a representative cross-section of a lot of different kinds of people. So we have professional writers. We have professional investors. We have some professors. We have people who have created parts of the ecosystem. I like that word that you used to describe this um, in terms of events, book signings, conferences, uh, summits, and that sort of thing. So it's a it's a broad mix of people. So we wanted to have a lot of mul- you know multiple voices, different points of view, uh, which is kind of neat because even even though everyone has their own special take and their own wonderful particular recollections, there's still this this ecosystem, this feeling that it's a, a, a very particular culture. And the story with Joel Greenblatt is great. In 1998, he and John Petrie wanted to launch the Value Investors Club, which was going to be a place where people pick stocks using the Graham-Dodd method of uh, determining what the intrinsic value of a, a company is and, and buying it if the uh, it could be bought at a very low price. Well, at, at that time, that method of, that, of, of investing was very marginalized because the tech uh, boom was um, – ev- everything was going up, and so it didn't seem – it seemed very old-fashioned. So they were having a hard time launching the Value Investors Club, and they said, you know, we need a brilliant marketing strategy. Where are the value investors? Where do people go? And they said, the Berkshire meeting. We've got to go to the Berkshire meeting. How are we going to get them interested at the Berkshire meeting? They said, well, I know, Cunningham's – Essays of Warren Buffett is uh, coming out in a new edition. Let's let's buy that and give it away. And, and so they they called me, ordered five thousand copies, <laughs> had it printed locally, and I drove a U-Haul truck right up to the front of the exhibit hall, uh, which I don't think you could do today. And John and Joel started handing it out from the back of the truck. Um, they've got some funny twists on the story in there in the beginning. No one would take it. They're trying to hand out a free book, and these skeptical value investors thought, who would be giving us something free? But then eventually a few people took it, a few more people took it, the word got around the center, and all of a sudden they had lines longer than uh, all all around the corner of the block, and so they got rid of all 5,000 copies. Great story. You know, uh, I think your biggest contribution to the whole um, Berkshire thing is is the, this pointing out this soft stuff, that the values and the culture are what – make Berkshire special, not necessarily just the intrinsic value and float that, that we all, you know, uh, leaped on his insights. Why, how did Berkshire get such special uh, shareholders? Companies to get the shareholders they deserve, right? That's a great quote. And I think the answer in Berkshire's case is that the company was created by an investor and it's been run by an investor. Very few big companies were created by investors. For investors, whether it's ExxonMobil and the Rockefellers, or Google and Larry Page, or, or Facebook and Zuckerberg, or IBM and Tom Watson, the, the, those are business people, entrepreneurs, managers, and nothing against any of those guys. But you're going to have a, a, a very different culture than a company like Berkshire, which was founded by an investor. His his primary and almost total focus is on the shareholders, the fellow shareholders, the partners. Now that means we take care of customers, take care of employees, take care of the planet and all this other stuff. But it, the, 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 the glue that holds the whole operation together is that it's a, a group of shareholders and it's run for shareholders. And it, 
that mindset has just been part of the company from the beginning, and the rest of the shareholders get that. The, the shareholders of Exxon and Mobil get Exxon Mobil get that too. So, very big institutions and large large conglomerations of money or the big investors in those companies, they're not as visible, they're not as important to Berkshire Hathaway. I've always thought that, it, 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 and the word's been used too, that, that they view it, Charlie and Warren, as a didactic platform. They're basically teachers. Yeah, I, that's a very important point, Jim. The What they've done for decades is educate the shareholders about the special features of Berkshire. And what that has done, in terms of your point about getting the shareholders you deserve, is it's mostly weeded out the shareholders who are interested in a quick buck or they'd like to buy the stock and flip it in three months or the, the group of shareholders that insist that a company has to just be focused on one thing and not allow for this diversified conglomerate and uh, a shareholder that is, that is in- concerned about the tax consequences of corporate policy such as paying dividends or, or selling companies. And so Warren and Charlie have spent their careers – at Berkshire, educating the shareholders on how they think about the business, and the effect has been that shareholders who like the the, the knowledge, who appreciate those tenets of um, permanence, of reinvesting capital rather than distributing it, of retaining businesses rather than selling, those who get that kind of model are those who have stuck around mostly. It's not perfect. There are some, some short-term shareholders in the mix, but the overwhelming... Uh, demographic of the Berkshire shareholder is a, an educated one who have learned those lessons that have been taught and, and agree with them. You'll see to the best of Biz Talk 2018. Attention, small business owners. Growing your business can be tough. Just when you thought you were making money, you found out that you owe the government money. And now that you owe the IRS their cut of your business profits, you may be broke. And if you don't take things seriously, you could go to jail or have your business shut down. But you do have an option. If the IRS is threatening you for unpaid taxes, call the Tax Resources Network. Their tax professionals and ex-IRS agents have over 23 years of experience dealing with the IRS, saving business owners and the self-employed millions in tax dollars. Let us negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. We may be able to reduce your tax debt for a lot less than you owe, help with the IRS audit, and even criminal investigations. If your business owes the IRS $15,000 or more and the IRS is threatening you, don't wait and let your business get shut down or worse. Call for a free consultation. Call 800-910-4980. 800-910-4980. That's 800-910-4980. Again, 800-910-4980. And finally, sports investigative journalist from the Wall Street Journal, Ken Bensiger, looks into the FIFA soccer scandal, the biggest sports scandal in history. And the new book that's just out, and it's uh, coincident with the Soccer World Cup, Red Card, How the U.S. Blew the Whistle on the World's Biggest Sports uh, Scandal. It's the first insider account. Welcome, Ken. Uh, Thanks for having me. Um, First of all, tell people what Red Card means. So red card is, is a uh, term from soccer. Um, so uh, trying to play a, a small, uh, gentle play on words there. Um, a red red card in the game of soccer is when someone uh, commits a, a penalty or a foul that's so severe that they have to be um, ejected from the game. Um, so it's sort of the highest degree of penalty in the sport. Um, there's a, a, a similar uh, infraction that's less severe called a yellow card. And that, uh, well, as it sounds like, is a yellow card, and that's a warning, essentially. Um, but if you get a red card as a player, they throw you out. And so this, because this investigation was of corruption within soccer, uh, and because the people who were finally caught up uh, for having committed criminal acts were, you know, um, indicted, arrested, and thrown in jail, um, we, we thought it was sort of the severest thing that could happen to them. And we thought the name uh, red card, or I thought the name red card was apropos. I think people will see it's pretty apt by the time we get done. Now, we're on the eve of the World Cup. Uh, it's in Russia, and then it's in Qatar, which is 115 degrees and um, kind of a small Middle East country. Uh, how did both Russia and uh, Qatar even get picked? Typically, FIFA would do the voting. And FIFA, by the way, is the uh, international sports organization um, uh, in charge of all soccer in the world, sort of the top-level organization that oversees every other 
uh, soccer organization down below it, uh, and which determines where the World Cup is held. Um, uh, and it's a FIFA is, a, is an acronym, the name. Um, uh, FIFA typically holds a, a vote every uh, X number of years, I think, every six or eight years to determine where the following um, World Cup will be held. And um, uh, in, in 2010, they had a vote, which is very curious because unlike every other time in sort of memory, the vote was held for two different World Cup cycles simultaneously. They decided that they were going to vote in, in, in December 2010 um, for the location of both the 2018 and 22 World Cups at the same time. When they announced that, a huge rush of countries came in all wanting uh, their opportunity to host the World Cup because the feeling was it's this big, very prestigious event, it's an opportunity um, for a country to showcase itself um, before the biggest audience in the whole world. Um, the World Cup uh, draws um, a gigantic television audience, even larger than the Olympics. Um, uh, the passion in most in most of the world for the sport um, is is huge, and so a lot of countries, um, the United States included, feel like the chance to hold this event was a prestigious thing that they that they would really like. With that division, um, you created sort of some front front runners in the two categories, but in in the in the European group, which was vying for 2018, your clear front runners were uh, uh, England and Russia. Um, there was other bits from a few other places, but those were the two uh, people that we thought that everyone thought would win. And then separately for 2022, the the clear front runner by far was the United States. Um, Australia was in there, and um, uh, Korea, South Korea was in there, and there's a few other countries in there. But it was clear that really the U.S. was the front runner. Uh, there was Qatar in the mix, but no one, you know, even took it seriously. Qatar is a country that's yeah. tiny. It has an inhospitable climate for uh, hosting a soccer tournament at that time of year. Cause it's, uh, the World Cup is always held in June and July. Um, and in June and July in Qatar, it has daytime temperatures that are, are you know, barely fit for, for human consumption. Um, and it's a very, it, it has no real soccer history. Um, uh, Qatar has never qualified for a World Cup. I don't think they've ever ranked much higher than about a hundredth in the world in terms of their uh, football team. And so it really wasn't clear they, they had anything sort of going for them. Now, interestingly, Christopher Steele uh, makes an appearance in this scandal, and people will know he was behind the Trump dossier that BuzzFeed um, released, and you're with BuzzFeed. Um, talk a little bit about that, and, and also the, the Trump Tower and even some of the sleazy friends of Trump uh, Chuck Blazer in particular, we'll talk more about him later, appear in this scandal as well. So Christopher Steele uh, played an absolutely uh, central role in the, in the story of the FIFA, what became known as the FIFA case or the FIFA investigation uh, within, the, within the American DOJ. Christopher Steele was a, was a lifelong or a career MI6 um, agent for, for the UK, so he was a spy, um, essentially the kind of job that we imagine James Bond had. Well, he was... He was the real McCoy. He was a he was a Russia expert for the British Secret Service. Had uh, had, had at least one rotation in Russia doing um, uh, you know underground spy stuff, I suppose. And um, then he later was stationed at their desk in in London, and then spent time in France and other countries, and had a career as a spy. And ultimately, left and um, started a um, private company that he would do uh, research for corporations and others and law firms. Um, for a fee, and that's not uncommon for uh, former um, spy operatives, CIA, MI6, uh, people from other spy agencies around the world do that kind of thing. So he opened it up in 2009, and um, out, the ga- out of the gate, almost his first client was the English World Cup bid. So the, the, the sponsors and the corporations that were behind the bid for England to win the, to win the rights to hold the 2018 World Cup um, hired him and others to do research um, to help, the, help uh, improve their chances of winning. Um, and they hired him because they knew Russia was running as well to hold it to host it. And they wanted, they wanted Russia, they wanted sort of the most information they could get about Russia. And so Steele was retained to, to gather that. As he's gathering this information, he's discovering what he considers to be troubling things about the way Russia is running the bid, particularly under Vladimir Putin's oversight. And after a few months of gathering this kind of information, he finally decides that that it's not enough just to tell the British bid. There's, um, there's other people who ought to know as well. And 
he had been he had been at the same time developing a separate relationship with the FBI. Um, the FBI had come to him for information about a an illegal gambling um, and illegal bookmaking ring um, that was run mostly out of of all places the Trump Tower in Manhattan. Um, that that gambling ring ring was run by a apparently by a, a Russian organized crime figure head of an organized crime family in Russia. And um, these FBI investigators who are specialists in Russian organized crime went to London and were introduced to Steele and they were looking for information about the head of this Russian organized crime family. And um, a few months later, Chris Steele called the FBI agents uh, back and said, listen, I have information about a different matter that may be of interest to you. This has been the Best of Business Talk 2018. Again, thanks to our listeners. Thanks to our producer, John Iannuzzi, for all the great work he's done editing the Best Of series on Forensic Talk and Business Talk, and for all he does during the year, making this a great show.